Okay, so I'll kind of start us off this on this topic. Um, we heard a little bit of this morning about um, Indiana, um, and I wasn't sure what all was going to be covered, so I kind of just put this quick slideshow together, trying to show you where we what we have what happened with us. Um, of course, we knew Spotted Lantern Fly was coming in. I started hearing about it from Dana at uh, some of my first meetings that I went to on a national basis. Um, but it, and we knew that there was a Spotted Lantern Fly dashboard out there. We knew that we could kind of get an idea of where it would be coming from. But it wasn't until about 2018 that we really got into um, heavily. Um, uh, searching for this insect pest. Um, we had heard by then that it was starting to swarm and it was starting to move out of the area that it originally showed up in, um, but we still figured we had plenty of time. In fact, the prediction models actually told us that, of course, it would, be, would take until 2032 before it came anywhere close to Indiana. Um, so, but we thought, okay, well, we know even our best efforts sometimes fall short. So we're gonna start surveying in some of our, um, of our tree of heaven. And we had had some tree of heaven surveys done here in Indiana in the past. Um, so we knew where to go and look for them. Um, and we, we knew we had a budding vineyard industry growing here. Um, and we had a couple other orchards that, that would be the place where these things might show up. Um, in fact, um, we knew exactly where the vineyards were because the extension agency of at Purdue have put together some websites um, letting people know that that's where people can go for vineyard tours um, and we knew where to go. So we knew where we could survey. And we also knew that um, being the crossroads of America, there's a lot of traffic that goes through. So some of our first er, first um, reports and calls in about spotted lantern fly were things like, well, I was at a gas station somewhere up in the Chicago area, and I think it might have been in Indiana. Um, yeah, go look there for the spotted lantern fly. So for our best efforts, we did go and trace some of those down, but of course, um, it didn't lead to anything. Um, but we knew we had a booming um, logging industry. We get a lot of lumber in from other surrounding states, including Pennsylvania. Um, we've got uh, several rail lines that go through the middle of Indiana. Um, and then there's a lot of camping and um, um, RV sales that go on here in Indiana. So we had some places to go and look. <clears throat> Um, and so we conducted several surveys um, starting mostly in 2018 when we started getting farm bill funding for these surveys. Um, but we went and looked at trace forwards, we looked at vineyards, we had um, tree of heaven windshield surveys. Um, we would go in and look for this insect at our nurseries and our nursery dealers. Uh, a lot of Indiana's nursery stock comes from outside of the state at this point through distribution warehouses, uh, through box stores. So that had been an entry point for other pathogens. We knew we should keep an eye out um, for the, the same thing happening there. So, um, but we found nothing until um, we got a email from a gentleman in Southern Indiana, um, in BV, Indiana, which is in Switzerland County saying, hey, I, I was out drinking coffee on my front porch this morning and saw this insect. I think it's spotted lanternfly and I don't think that's here in Indiana, is it? Um, so this wasn't until the end of July or mid July, I think it was that this was reported. Um, and so we sent an inspector down there right away, of course, because it's pretty distinctive. It's hard to confuse with any other insect. Um, this is the tree here on the left that the insect was found in, but when the, at first glance when the inspector looked around, he really couldn't find anything else in the surrounding area. Um, fortunately, the homeowner then walked into the wood lot that's behind his property, which looks like is the picture of, on the right here. 
is from that woodlot. And this woodlot's really only used for hunting every once in a while by the co-owners of the woods. Um, and they aren't in there very much except for the kids that want to come and play. Um, and when the homeowner went in there, he started seeing more evidence of spotted lantern fly. So we went back and realized that there wasn't a population there. Um, we started seeing as soon as you walk into the most infested area, you start seeing the city mold on all of the plants. You can hear the honeydew dropping from the plant, the insects sucking on the sap. Um, the bees start circulating in, in the surrounding area, chasing down the, the honeydew. Um, and they start congregating in certain areas. So all these were actually pictures um, of Indiana's infestations. And then we started looking a little closer and we could see some egg masses that were obviously at least a year old that were not from this previous year. Um, so at that point we knew that it had been there a couple of years and now we're just spotting it. <clears throat> um, let's see, the best, um, the, the information about the site that it's in, um, the homeowner, it was uh, at a house that was right here off Bethel Chapel Road. Um, and that's about um, a few miles in from the Ohio River across the, the river from Kentucky. Um, most notable about this spot, it's actually in Switzerland County, which is the home of the first commercial winery in the United States um, in the early 1800s. But they still have a <clears throat> annual Swiss wine festival every year where people come from all around. It's a several day event um, that highlights um, vineyards in the area and the surrounding areas and local uh, breweries and vineyards. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is actually Markland Dam, um, which is about two miles south of our infestate site, which is right here in our red spot. Um, so we looked at that site and we were trying to figure out how it could have possibly ended up in Indiana. Um, and there were a lot of different things that could have been. Um, about two miles down to the uh, east, you can find an Indian casino um, and a big golf course. Um, there are RV parks that line the river um, for people that are living there annually or seasonally or even coming down to visit in their RV. And then right across the river from the infested site, there's actually several steel mills in Kentucky um, that get barges full of material from out uh, east all the time. So we looked into all those different avenues to try and determine what it was, but it wasn't until we talked to the homeowners um, that found out that um, one of the homeowners on the adjacent properties had actually moved there several years back, three to five years, I think it was, um, from a spot in Pennsylvania. And he had moved out here um, for the property because there was a lot of place to spread out. And he had fallen in love with the property um, to conduct some of his uh, sporting dog shows. So he has folks coming in from the surrounding area and surrounding states to compete at his sporting dog shows um, and bringing their RVs in and out. Um, and he actually being from Pennsylvania himself um, was familiar with spotted lanternfly. Um, but the best we can figure is that either one of uh, the events there um, was a source of the infestation or perhaps some of the materials that had he had brought with him when he moved in. Um, but this was not something that we could foresee, obviously. It was a big, you know, surprise to all of us. And if that homeowner had not um, reported finding it, we probably still wouldn't know it was there. Um, in the meantime, we've gone in and done some treatments. Um, we've treated over 400 um, smaller Alanthus with a herbicide to try and cut it down, hoping to push the, the pressure of the feeding onto the tree, the larger Elanthus that we're not treating with a herbicide. Um, it's called a trap tree and we can then spray pesticides on those trap trees, to kill anything that feeds off of, of the larger Elanthus. Um, we have had a lot of help from folks in other states. Um, I won't 
a big thank you to the folks out in Pennsylvania that came in and trained our staff on what, how to do this, how to set traps, how to do treatments, um, give them some idea of their experiences. Um, and then we went to work. So we've um, now discovered that it's in several different areas um, within that woodlot. Um, and we're continuing to search for new infestations. We have contacted the homeowners and property owners in the surrounding areas. They've all received letters saying, hey, we're looking for this insect. Keep an eye out, look for it. Let us know if you find anything. Um, like I said, this spot isn't well traversed. Um, it's really only entered and exited a few times a year during the hunting seasons. Um, but it, that also means that it's really difficult an area to move around in. It's um, not well cultivated. It's kind of full of so many invasives. It's tricky to get in and out of. Um, and so we have been going about treating the, the uh, Atlantis and the smaller Atlantis under three inches in diameter um, and continuing to treat the larger Atlantis with pesticides, kind of trying to remove as much of that population as we can. Now, our biggest concern then, of course, is that it would spread out of this infested area right here um, and get down to some of these more heavily traversed areas. There's a huge RV resort here that um, home that uh, seasonal workers will come and live there um, in their campers, work at the steel mill for some part of the season, and then go back to their home uh, in other states. Um, and that's our biggest concern and that, that this material might spread to, towards that um, RV park and then create an even bigger problem down the road. Um, and then across the river, Kentucky's already started doing their outreach efforts um, and have put up some billboards um, and other signage trying to let people know in the area about spotted lanternfly. Um, this summer was an there was a little bit of confusion with the call centers. Um, a lot of the East Coastern states got overrun with some of their spot and lantern fly calls. Um, so they had no choice but to actually shut down some of their call centers. Unfortunately, when you Google how to report spotted lantern fly, it comes up with the phone number for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. Um, so we ran through a lot of phone note calls this summer um, and had to get them back to the states where they were actually calling from. Uh, so that caused some confusion there. Um, we're hoping that um, that can be modified in the future so it doesn't happen again. Um, but we didn't want to close down our call in line because we are near the front of this infested area. And so we want to make sure that those lines of communication are open to the general public here in Indiana. And then we thought we had everything under control and we got a call from FedEx um, at, that had had a plane show up in uh, California with uh, an adult that was dead spotted lanternfly and the last port before it left um, California was Indianapolis. Now Indianapolis is a regional hub for FedEx so a lot of flights come in there and then go back out to all over the, the world. Um, and what most likely happened in this instance, we can't find any evidence of an infestation here in the Indianapolis area. We actually had some intermittent federal employees go out and look at this, any tree of heaven that they could find in the surrounding area around the airport. Nothing turned up positive or any sign of honeydew or any kind of um, materials that look like they might be infested. Um, so, but then we figured out that some of these planes before they come to Indianapolis were originating on the East Coast. So there's a good chance that the adult got into um, the plane at a different airport uh, and, and then wasn't found here in Indiana before they moved it on to then to the West Coast. Um, now, in certain times of the year, we'll have a little help because we do are in the middle of a Japanese beetle area. And so they do have excluders down there at um, FedEx and they use them during the Japanese beetle season. Unfortunately, Japanese beetle season is shorter than our spotted lantern fly uh, flight period. And so the Japanese beetle season will end and we'll still have some time 
where a spotted lanternfly can still be flying around. But again, nothing in Indianapolis is telling us right now that there's any spots of infestation. So that's good news. We've got a little bit more time to work all that out. In the meantime, we've been continuing to do our outreach efforts. We've got a weekly review letter that goes out to anybody that wants it. And it was originally set out to be for our nursery licensed um, vendors, but we've got over 6,500 people now that are receiving it on a weekly basis and they kind of get their um, news from us. What's the newest thing to look for? Or what kind of things are we seeing out in the field kind of a thing? Um, and it's helped us uh, build some bridges with our um, general public um, for reporting um, and letting them know things to keep an eye out for. Um, and then we stress, of course, going to the right labs and making sure that you've got the right diagnostics um, and we've got several different op options for them to report to us. We've got the phone numbers, uh, we've got an email that, that's how ours came in, and then we've got an app that we've got out there right now. Um, anybody can report anything that they find that's different for identification or for um, just reporting that they're an invasive in that area. So that's all helped us. And that's about it for me. Any questions so far? Yeah, there's a question in the uh, chat actually that probably anyone could answer, but um, talk about trap trees. It seems like Tree of Heaven is a good trap tree, but previous speaker talked about removing Tree of Heaven. What do you think is the best way to manage Tree of Heaven? It kind of depends on the situation and the, the plot of land you're talking about, what's in there. Um, ours is full of uh, um, Tree of Heaven. So, you know, we have to do something because that's the preferred host type. So, you know, you can either try and cut everything down, which is kind of not practical in a woodlot that size, or you can use them um, to your advantage, which is why we decided to go about cutting down anything or spraying and treating anything that was under three inches in diameter and then concentrating our pesticides on the larger um, diameter. Uh, tree of heaven. Now the tree of heaven um, for what we can see here in Indiana is definitely the preferred host, um, at least during the summer months when we're out there treating. Um, I hear that later on in the year, um, some of the other trees are, are like walnut um, become more of a preferred host, but here in Indiana, the tree of heaven definitely in that area is fed on most frequently. All right, thanks, Megan. Appreciate it. Um, I think there's some questions rolling in still in the chat. If everyone can remember to focus those into the Q and A section, that would be ideal. Thank you. Um, and if you can, can you pull your screen share off, Megan? Cool. Thanks. Um, next, let's kick it over to David Giannino in Virginia. David, there you are. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, and I would like to thank the Spider Lanternfly 101 Planning Committee for um, asking me to participate on this panel. Um, so I don't have a PowerPoint today uh, since this is kind of presentation and discussion based. I, my What I wanted to talk about when it comes to Spotted Lanternfly and it's coming faster than you expect or um, how would we have handled things differently? Um, part of what I would like to focus on really is just pathways, um, movement of Spotted Lanternfly, things that we didn't really anticipate or expect, how we surveyed for the pest, and then um, maybe something to look out for in the future for those states that are either anticipating spotted lanternfly or are currently serving, surveying for it. So kind of as Megan mentioned in our initial response, we were following some of the recommended locations, surveying on Tree of Heaven, um, following railroads, following travel centers, really trying to put our best foot forward, going to vineyards, looking at those particular locations. And for the first couple of years, we felt pretty good that those types of surveys were indicative of where spotted lanternfly was. Obviously, we were doing delimiting around our generally infested area. And so that kind of lended itself more towards, you know, understanding how spotted lanternfly was moving out from uh, in our case, Winchester in northern Frederick County, which is the top part of northern Virginia. 
Um, however, as the population continued to expand and as we got further and further into our spotted lanternfly experience, we were finding a lot more finds um, in locations that we had not anticipated before, um, movement pathways, and also entities that we probably needed to communicate with that we hadn't really regulated as a normal part of our business in the past. And what I really just kind of wanted to do is give some examples of locations where we did find populations and what might be attributed to that. So we do talk about railroads um, quite a bit. And what we have found in Virginia is the locations that we were looking for were railroads at big uh, industrial areas or high traffic business spots. But what we found is that more and more of the sites where trains tend to cross roads uh, stop at interchanges or have loading stations where the train is slowing down. We've actually found more populations there than at just general railroad along either state roads um, or even near industrial business offloading sites. So really where the train starts to slow, that's kind of where we've been finding it. So for us, that changed our strategy, going to crossroads, going to stops, and we started to find more populations that way, um, which kind of helped us narrow our focus instead of, you know, trying to survey all of the railroads in Virginia. Because with limited resources, it's really important to know where to look and where the best place to look is. The other thing too was we searched a lot on Tree of Heaven and did a lot of Tree of Heaven surveys, which in the beginning was good because it gave us a, a very narrow field of species to look for. However, what we've also found is, you know, you can find spotted lanternfly on different trees, um, especially depending on what type of year you're serving or what time of year you're surveying. So, you know, when adults are active in the, you know, summer to fall, you can look off host on other or off tree of heaven onto other hosts such as maples or walnuts. And so kind of opening that survey venue for us helped us find more populations too, um, instead of limiting to just tree of heaven windshield surveys. Again, in the beginning, it's, it's great to do that, um, but also knowing that biologically they're attracted to different plants or go off tree of heaven and then back. Um, so that kind of helped plan how we were doing those surveys. And then lastly, really one of the things is just the type of pathways that we were encountering were ones uh, that we typically don't work with. Um, so for instance, when we had a report, follow-up report for uh, some pumpkins that came in bulk. Now those were harvested from a farm field where spotted lanternfly was known to be, and that ended up with an adult in a um, big old crate of pumpkins. And so for us to try and figure out where those pumpkins came from, it was very difficult. Um, you know, you're always trying to work backwards, but that is a situation. We've also had one with produce, so lettuce, uh, there was some crates that out, you know, where the produce is being loaded onto a truck and it wasn't the truck itself, it was in the product. And so those are just a couple of topics of knowing that there are so many pathways is very difficult, um, but establishing some relationships early on and kind of thinking critically about, okay, where could it potentially be coming in from? And I know it's a huge task. But if you can either narrow fields of where you're surveying and what you're looking for or broaden as well um, in different situations, it would really help for states that are either anticipating spotted lanternfly or are surveying for it now. And I'd say maybe one other thing to add is, is really just thinking about groups and organizations um, that might not be a standard or a typical agricultural entity that we work with. So, you know, instead of producers or growers um, in Northern Virginia, we have a very big um, horse farm population. Now, obviously it's nowhere near as big as Kentucky's, but if you think about trailers that sit outside, if it's in the spotted lanternfly area, that trailer could be moving um, egg masses from show to show from, you know, and those shows could be in different states. And so that's just one example of something that, well, we, you know, it's very hard to regulate that group because they're not registered with us, but there are organizations like the Northern Virginia Horsemen's Association, and, and that's kind of and how we would reach out to them. So I just wanted to throw those kind of hot topics out there and see if there were questions um, and, and just maybe offer some, some words of wisdom that there are ways to 
fine tune this um, so that you don't find yourself running all over your state or your location trying to prepare. So Scott, I'll, I'll kind of end there and see if there's questions. No, that, that sounds good, David. I, I don't see any questions in the in the Q and A, so um, I'll I'll invite anybody to to fill in something um, as this continues. If if something jogs your mind and you want to put a question in there, and, and also to the presenters to keep an eye on on that Q and A session. So, um, but thank you again. Appreciate your time, David, and your insight as always. Um, next, let's switch over to Chris again in New York. Chris, are you ready? Sure, Scott. I'm, right, I'm ready to go. You. I'm I'm here. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, like David, I I didn't uh, I didn't set up any slides for this particular part of the session. I thought I'd kind of go through a few things here. Um, you know, some things that we've learned along the way that I think are perhaps helpful. Um, and again, you know, it's nice to sort of have this conversational format because we can play off a little bit off of one another. And and so. Um, sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, picking up on what Megan was talking about as far as reporting is concerned. Um, we were actually one of the one of the states that um, some of our reports from Staten Island were going to Indiana. And, um, you know, kudos to Indiana for getting getting their um, their Google Analytics in a good place where they were at the top of the list. Um, but uh, we've taken a little bit of a different approach on reporting, and we've tried to actually um, funnel all of the reporting into uh, into an electronic format with with uh, emails. Uh, basically, it's powered off of uh, Survey One Two Three, so folks can go on there, they can fill out a form, uh, and then send that into us, and that helps us to manage it. There are some things that you can do a little bit in the background and sort of sort them and get them to the right place. And that way you don't have somebody who's, you know, sitting uh, answering, answering a telephone call, telephone line and uh, becoming overwhelmed on that. And that was, you know, that was stuff that we actually learned from Pennsylvania um, with some of their efforts early on. Um, sort of continuing to play off a little bit of the you know, the outreach side of things. And we're going to talk more about this in the summit here in a, in a week or so or a couple of weeks. But, um, you know, as you're doing your outreach, um, you know, one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is, is that when you do outreach, you also are uh, in an indirect way, you're setting, uh, you're setting some expectations from the public. Um, so one of the things that you know, that we ran into uh, this past summer, in particular, uh, coming out of uh, the New York City area was, um, I reported this, uh, when, are you, when are you coming to, to treat my yard kind of a thing. So you got to be thoughtful about your reporting, you got to be thoughtful about your outreach, uh, you have to be thoughtful about what the message is. And you also have to be able to sort of pivot with that message a little bit, which is something that we're going to be talking about uh, at the summit in a couple of weeks. Um, I think it's also really important to think about the fact that we're all at different places in this. And so, um, you know, everybody's situation is different. Uh, you know, the previous speaker, Megan, uh, you know, Megan has a, a very specific sort of a set of circumstances and, and situation. Um, and that's very different than the situation uh, in New York or some of the other other eastern states. Um, and I think you know you can you can take a little bit of advantage of that. Um, you know, I think in Indiana type of a situation, uh, you may be you may be talking about uh, an eradication sort of a thing and you know delaying infestation. Uh, whereas in, in another state, you might be thinking, uh, have a little bit different take uh, on your plan. So, you know, I came out of a 20 plus year career in extension before I came into, um, into regulatory work. So the outreach side is always very interesting uh, to me. Um, but the other thing that I kind of brought along with me as I came over from the extension world was, you know, a real interest in, in evaluation and, you know, asking the questions about how we're doing, what are we doing, what can we do differently? 
And so as I look at, you know, a couple of years under our, our belt here, um, you know, we had, we had some time to do some planning uh, because of the really great work that, that uh, Pennsylvania and our other neighbors did at, at holding this back. Um, and we had some plans in place. We had operated under an incident command structure for a period of time, probably in 2016 or 17, where when we really thought that introduction was imminent. Um, what I would say about that is, is that that's a, a really a useful set of planning tools and operational tools. Um, uh, but it's also very, very staff intensive. And so if you go into that type of a mode, you want to have it be for a limited period of time so that you don't um, sort of burn out some of your, your resources um, uh, in that stage. Um, I mentioned that we had a plan. And so, you know, not to get into the, into the nitty gritty of having uh, of what was in our plan, our plan had some assumptions in it. And one of the assumptions that we started with that I think um, uh, was was incorrect was we assumed that um, our survey uh, and and when I say survey I mean pre uh, pre introduction that our survey would would tell us when this was here that our outreach would tell us when this was here that we would have sort of an early warning that we probably would have one point of introduction and that we would be able to go in uh, and and treat that area and buy a little bit more time. Our situation evolved uh, quite a bit differently, uh, actually, which I alluded to earlier. And so, you know, we found uh, the Staten Island population, which was actually uh, found by our partners uh, in the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation. And then, you know, following that through the, the fall of um, 2020, we had a, a number of other reports. And so before long, we were actually, rather than dealing with it in, in one locate, one geographic location, we were dealing with it in several geographic locations. And so for some of you that I've talked to uh, a lot about this uh, in the last year or so, it kind of was the, uh, if, you, if you have a, uh, a beach metaphor of you're standing in the in the surf and the big wave comes and breaks over you. That was kind of what our experience was there. Um, I mentioned uh, parks, and so one of the things you know uh, when I look at a, when I do evaluation, I'm I'm looking at things that uh, that we did well and that were strengths, as well as looking at things that we could have done better. I think one of the things that's been a real strength in our approach and our program here in New York has been uh, leveraging partnerships. Um, so we have uh, a pretty aggressive invasive species law in New York State. Um, my commissioner is the co-chair of the Invasive Species Council along with the commissioner at DEC. And so because of that, we have very long-standing relationships around the invasive species conversation with um, nine key state agencies. Um, and so we've been able to leverage that um, with our Department of Transportation, our Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation, our DEC, who does a lot of the forest health type stuff. Also, um, I mentioned in my presentation earlier um, that we have the had the relationship with the Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management that program operates under the umbrella of our invasive species program in the state. So be thinking, you know, broadly about who can help you with this. Um, you know, you're going to go from a place where you, you think you are in a good place and you have adequate resources to a, to a place where um, you're challenged from a resource perspective. And so you need to be looking at um, all of all of those potential partners. We've also had a really great partnership with, uh, and again, this is through our Invasive Species Council, uh, with the um, uh, uh, with the IMAP Invasives as well as iNaturalist. And so, um, one of the things that we've been doing is is we have a staff person who monitors the reports coming in on IMAP uh, Invasives and iNaturalist, and goes in and and confirms. 
uh, the ones that can be confirmed refers the others out to, um, you know, to inspectors or others to go out and take a look at. So there's lots of different avenues where information uh, is going to be coming into you. Uh, it doesn't have to always just be your surveyors. Um, it can be uh, lots of different people out there for you. With IMAP invasives, we've also gone out and we have had a um, had a, a plan where uh, people can adopt a grid in a public space, public park, uh, state forest, what have you, and go in, go out, take responsibility for surveying, and that's been very successful and has given us the opportunity to to multiply our survey. Um, you know, so those longstanding relationships have been have been really really important, and I think. Um, this is not a this is not a go it alone do it yourself project. This is um, you need cooperation from lots of different people um, uh, to get it done. The other thing, sort of on the on the um, on the um, challenging side that I'll throw out there before I pass it back to to Scott is um, you know. I think we do, uh, and I'm speaking for for states and 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 maybe for uh, APHIS as well. And I don't, you know, I don't uh, purport to speak for anybody but ag and markets. But I think as a rule, we do a very good job with survey. We're doing a pretty good job with detection. I think as I'm looking at the bigger picture um, and the next thing that comes to to New York, um, I'm thinking about how do I um, build upon my response capabilities, because I think that's been a challenge for us here. Um, and we've had some really good partners who've stepped up and, and uh, helped us with that. Um, but that's an area that I think is really important for you to be thinking about, um, about what sorts of resources you have in your state and how can you bring them to bear. So I think, Scott, I'll turn it back to you. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, just to just to touch on that. I mean, I think the the, the recurring theme here is is kind of to expect the unexpected and, and stay flexible. Um, you know, be able to pivot, be able to adjust uh, based on on what uh, you know what the next pitch is. If it's a curveball, slider, fastball, so be uh, be prepared. So, um, without further ado, I think um, you know that was a great segue into into Jillian Stevenson's um, communications talk and and uh, discussing partnerships and, and cooperation through communication. So we really touched on the operational side of it, but there's Jillian, take it away. All right, thank you. All right, let me get my screen up here and running. Okay. So first of all, yes, we are taking, uh, first of all, again, I'm Jillian Stevenson and I'm the Associate Director for Communications for the College of Agricultural Sciences at Penn State. And I am taking a little different turn in terms of the presentation. I'll be talking about some key resources that we recommend you consider developing as you prepare for spotted lanternfly coming to your area. Also joining me today will be Jay Lusevich from the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And he's going to review an important resource for recording spotted lanternfly. So well, he'll be on here in a moment. So first, let me move this screen a little bit, okay. So starting out, one of the first resources we found extremely important to develop, not surprisingly, is a comprehensive spotted lanternfly website. And our website um, includes all the basics and it has everything for, from how to report, identifying the spotted lanternfly to make sure you, you're actually seeing this pest, and then how to manage it on your property. And it's for both businesses and for the, the homeowner. The site also includes information on how to comply with our spotted lanternfly quarantine here in Pennsylvania, as well as a link to our uh, spotted lanternfly permit training for businesses. And currently this website is very active. We get quite a few visitors during the, the spotted lanternfly season, which for us is anywhere from early May to um, mid November. And we see um, this last season we had about a million unique page views um, to this site. So that's pretty significant for us. So another um, important resource that we um, have in place are two ways to report sightings. We do this online through our, our um, website. And what you see here 
is our um, a link from our page that directs you to um, first allows the visitor to actually identify if they're actually seeing the spotted landerfly. And then this um, uh, will then take them to a form after they click on, yes, this is indeed what I'm seeing, takes them to this form, which directs them to a site uh, through the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And Jay, if you wanna go ahead and speak a little to this. Uh, Jay? Is that better, Jillian? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Be there for a minute. Star sex is an important thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So yeah, I just want to talk briefly about how we collect public reports um, and what we've learned from that data. Um, so as Jillian just mentioned, we collect reports essentially two ways, either by phone call or through this public reporting tool. Um, our, the folks that if you're making a report, you can do that directly through the website, either on your phone or a computer. Or if you contact the Penn State call center, they actually enter this data directly into the reporting app. And what's great about that is that means that all of our reports go to one location. Um, and that's a, a, a great thank you to Jillian and her team for, for helping us out with that. Um, do you wanna go ahead and next slide? Um, so really quick, you know, very basic information that we collect. So we collect uh, reporters' names, um, their addresses, uh, the address where they saw spot a lantern fly, <clears throat> and any contact information so we can reach out to them, whether that's a phone number, an email address. Um, in 2020, so this is on the right-hand side of the screen there, uh, we started collecting spotted lanternfly that were uh, saw uh, when, when they were out in the field and also the life stage. Um, so that's, that's not required, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But I just wanted to give you an idea that this is the kind of detail that we're collecting. Um, so if you want to go ahead to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to kind of show you just an idea so you, so you know what to expect, whether you're a state that already has spotted lanternfly or a state that's going to be getting spotted lanternfly in the future. We hope that's not the case and we're doing our best to keep it from, from coming to you, but just so you're ready. Um, so number one, you're going to receive the majority of your reports between June and October. Uh, generally speaking, 95% of our reports come in during those five months. Um, and so far, since we, we technically began this as a trial in 2018, but if we're just looking from, from 2019 to 2021, uh, we have received over 210,000 reports on spotted lantern fly since 2019. Um, so give or take, that's you know, roughly 70,000 public reports a year. So as Chris was just saying, and I can't stress this enough, um, phone calls and emails will quickly overwhelm you and your staff. Uh, we definitely in Pennsylvania, we learned this the hard way. Um, and by putting up a specific spot of lantern fly public reporting tool has been a great way for us to both communicate with the, the public and for them to communicate back with us. And on top of that, we're gathering more data than we ever could with just having surveyors out in the field alone. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so another thing just to note, so this is a, another, another way just to show that. So what kind of reports are we getting? Like I said, 95% of those reports are coming during June to October, that's your living life stage. As you can see on the left side of the screen there, adults are by far the largest thing that are reported, but we do break this down through different, um, you know, each life stage, but also combinations of life stages. Um, and so what you can see again, 95% of that is living life stages, 4% of that is egg masses. Um, and then we have blank in the middle, uh, which is the 1% one, uh, 1 of reports. And that's something that I just wanna kind of where I just want to finish up with you guys today is just a, a happy note. Um, as Julia had noted earlier this morning, in addition to possibly seeing fewer lantern fly in, um, you know, in the, the traditional quarantine area, which would be Burks, like the southeast corner of Pennsylvania, um, you know, debating if there was a population crash or not, we also saw a, a really large drop in, in overall reports. Um, so we're attributing that right now to both a combination of fewer insects, but also reporter fatigue. Um, folks in that area have been dealing with this for almost eight years now, so they're, they're, they're getting tired of talking about it with us. Um, but we're going to be pushing outreach and reporting messages to, to get to that. And then going back to this 1% of blank reports, again, this is a field that is not required. Um, these folks put it in, you know, they, they insert that information for us. So when we're talking about 122,000 reports that we received since we started collecting this data, that only 1,700 of those, um, a little over 1%, are not telling us that, um, that tells me the public is still very much engaged. Um, that's a very encouraging thought moving forward. So thanks, Julian. Back to you. Great. Thank you. Let's go to the next 
screen here. Okay, everybody see that new screen there? <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Um, uh, I should mention too, um, the partnership that we do have with PDA, especially in terms of reporting has been really key. And uh, Jay mentioned our call center and we did establish a call center um, uh, in 2018 with a grant from USDA. And the, uh, as you see there, it's an 800 toll free number so that's very helpful for our residents to call in and report. Uh, we typically um, have between seven and 10 operators available between eight and five, Monday through Friday. And uh, we have the center call center set up from May through November. And in the off hours when the lines are busy or the callers receive, um, uh, or in the off hours or when the lines are busy, the callers receive a message and they're directed then to visit the website for more information or to report online using that form that Jay just uh, reviewed. And then from November through April, the manager of the call center then joins our extension customer service center. And here the manager handles the spotted lanternfly hot, hotline calls, which during the winter months are certainly not at the levels they are during the main season. And as well as the manager will back up our extension call center operators. The call volume for the hotline this last season was we, we had 14,270 calls as well as we answered 1,500 emails. And some of those come from the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And um, some of those are voicemails that are, follow, are forwarded to us from the department. And also our operators will then just go ahead and answer those. So in terms of printed materials that are some key resources that we've developed um, uh, that provide basic educational information on spotted lanternfly, the first you see here is our general information brochure. And this is really great for handing out. Um, it's a, a size of, that fits really well into a rack. And so it provides all the background information on spotted lanternfly, where it came from, uh, also the life stages, as well as we direct them once again to report to us online or via um, the hotline. Additionally, we developed a very inexpensive information card which folds into the size of a business card and it's really easy just to slip into a wallet or a pocket. So when folks are at your exhibits, they can easily take one of these and uh, walk off with some really good information. It has just the basics on the spotted lanternfly, um, the different life stage, stages of the pest. It also has our website and a QR code that will direct them uh, to our website for more information or to report. Another really popular piece for us has been this waterproof poster for displaying at public places such as trailheads or at, in park kiosks, in campgrounds and playgrounds, and also at the Pennsylvania Welcome Centers. And we were able to get these posted in the welcome centers with um, the help of our partners at the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. In which I'd like to add that the partnership that we've established here in Pennsylvania with the Department of Agriculture and USDA has been extremely beneficial to ensuring that we are consistent and in our coordinated messaging on the spotted lanternfly and that it's the same messaging between all partners. And that's really important. Another item we created, created this past year is a lawn sign, which is great for displaying near parking lots to raise awareness of the importance of checking uh, for the pests before traveling in or out of, out of the quarantine zone. And then once you raise public awareness of, of the pest, another resource we found extremely helpful is our spotted lanternfly management guide. And this guide includes the, basic of, the basics of spotted lanternfly and the management recommendations along with several user-friendly illustrations and charts. Now to help the other states in developing these resources I mentioned here, we share our design files for these pieces in a OneDrive folder along with resources from USDA. And I think I might've seen a question about uh, the coasters that um, someone might've picked up here in a Pennsylvania event. And those graphics are available on this site 
And I do have information. Um, if, if you're interested, you can contact me. I'll have my contact information here in a minute. And I'm also presenting at the Spotted Lanternfly Summit in March. And I'm gonna go over these resources and several other marketing and communication pieces that you might be interested in um, developing in your state. And so I hope you can plan to join us then. And our contact information, if you want to learn more about getting access to that OneDrive file of um, Spotted Lanternfly resources, or if you're interested in learning more about the online form that Jay spoke about. So with that, I'll go ahead and stop sharing and um, if there are any questions. Uh, Jillian, there was one in there about, um, from Gary about the efficacy of the printed materials. I'm, I'm guessing maybe it's more about, um, you know, how effective they are. Um, any, any insight on that? I mean, I can tell you right now that that's what we go with um, quite frequently is, is handouts and, and um, you know, physical materials that people can grab and, and leave and, you know, read at a later time. So any quick comments on that? Yes, actually, there's no one best tool. I think it's several tools in the toolbox that really make a difference. And this, the, the, this was, I had eight minutes. So <laughs> we have several other resources that include marketing campaigns to raise awareness, social media campaigns, ad campaigns, uh, transit ads. So it's a complete toolbox. And so it's hard to say that any one of these works, but I think a combination of all of these um, makes a difference. And um, yeah, so that's, I, 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 in my summit presentation, there's more information about what we found to be the most valuable marketing campaigns for us. So if you're interested, tune back in in March. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up here real quick with a uh, with a quick perspective from Illinois. Um, you know, we're we're kind of unique in this sense that uh, I think of all the states you've heard from today, we're the we're the one state that doesn't have spotted lantern fly yet. So I think, you know, this is a, a unique perspective on on basically practicing what's been preached and and uh, you know everything that everybody has said today, we've tried to incorporate into our um, you know be on the lookout approach. So. Um, we have a readiness plan. I know we talked about that and had a panel discussion last year surrounding that topic. Um, but again, kind of going back to what Chris mentioned, you know, curveballs and, and expect the unexpected and um, be ready to pivot, you know, with you can only do what you what you can do with what you have. And, and so that that readiness plan kind of identifies what your um, what your resources are, who your points of contact are moving forward, you know, identifying who your regulators are, who your surveys are, um, what your authorities are. That was another big thing that I think Dana brought up right before lunch is knowing who has the authority to go do what, you know, are you able to go on private property? Um, what happens about public property? So knowing that kind of information in advance is, is going to be critical. Um, as far as the communication side of it, like Jillian mentioned, um, you know, we set up a dedicated email address to take reports. Um, that's been linked into some of our cooperators at U of I, and then also my, my federal counterpart with USDA. So all three of us get notifications of emails, uh, email reports that come in so we can, uh, you know, have pretty good coverage. If anybody is off for a week or so on vacation, um, there's going to be, a, a, you know, one of us usually available to respond. So um, again, knowing what your resources are and, and having that almost ready to go when the time comes, I mean, I think we've all learned and, and realized that, that it's really not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when. And, and having, having what you have ready to go is, is going to give you that much more um, chance at success early on. You know, the, the, the name of the game becomes early detection and, and rapid response, right? And, and the sooner you can detect it, the sooner you can respond. Um, you know, we've been doing some surveys based on uh, based on some of the risk models that, that we've seen um, in my conversation with Matt earlier. Um, you know, you use what you can to do what you can where you can. Um, you know, we're looking at those high risk areas that we've identified and we've, we've seen some of those models identify. But then again, you know, as kind of a final parting thought, not to throw a, a wrench in the gears of, of success or progress, but, um, you know, the find in Indiana kind of throws things, um, you know, out the window. Um, 
you know, again, it was mentioned earlier on that, that it's unpredictable and it can show up anywhere. You know, we have ideas of what it's going to move on. And, and David did a great update on, on the pathways that, you know, we regulate uh, nursery stock, um, you know, plant movement, uh, imports, exports, all that kind of stuff. But we're not used to regulating um, trucks and, and marble and countertops and um, airplanes and trains. So, um, you know, you do what you can with what you got. I keep saying that, but it's really the truth. And um, you, you kind of... You, you, you do what you can is, is the bottom line. And I guess you can't get frustrated. You can't throw your hands up in the air because again, knowing that there's so much information and so much that's been done out there so far by a lot of these great people on this program that they're more than happy to, to pay it forward and help you out any way they can. So um, with that, I will, I will end before I get too, uh, too sappy maybe. <laughs> 